Good morning, everyone. Um, in the next few minutes, I'd basically like to expand a little bit on what Hussain was already discussing and look at it from the experiences that I've made in various projects in the, in the last few years. Um, when I look around me, at people around me, my neighbors, uh, people in organizations that I work with, that I, I see that we suffer from an agency deficit. There's a, a, a lack of ability that we feel to actually act, a gap to fill, um, that would allow us to more meaningfully act together. Um, we, we've seen how the, our global interconnectedness basically has created much more interdependencies and feedback loops, and we see that it creates all kinds of new complexities. Um, and we also feel that the rules that we have in place don't really help us deal with that, and that new rules that we try to make up to fix that actually make the problem worse. So we're desperate for meaningful action, but we don't see it around us. We don't see any of that. And we also see no real viable way for us to do it ourselves as individuals. We feel like much of the change that we see is done to us, much like the weather is. And around me, I see a lot of the people that I know simply disengage, stop reading the news, drop off, mind your own business. And, we, and they say, and we say, we hope for the better. It will be better tomorrow. Um, but despair cannot really be undone by hope. Uh, you know, uh, not if it takes the shape of salvationism. Uh, somebody will save us, a populist, an authoritarian, uh, a deity, or a speaker pontificating on stage like I am today. Uh, it will, hope will not help us if it takes the shape of techno-determinism. Somebody will come along, invent some technology, and that will fix everything for us. And hope will also not help if it takes the shape of denial. It will be better tomorrow. It will be better in five years' time. Um, the antidote that I find in, in, in you know, the, the work that I do where something really happens, the antidote to despair is not hope, but action. Uh, we need, so we need to find a path to agency, to really discover our own ability to do something, to re-empower ourselves. And I think that requires looking for agency at the network level, at group level, not within us as an individual. It re but that requires redesigning the tools that we use, both technology and methods and processes that we employ, stuff that we already know that works, but make them work for groups, fully embrace sort of the network world that, we, that we're in and lowering the threshold for people to use them. And it requires applying all those tools in contexts that are really meaningful to ourselves. So we also need to rediscover meaning for ourselves. And to find meaning, I think we, we need a macroscope. A macroscope is something that John Takara, the designer, described as uh, something that allows us to see what the aggregation is of all the tiny interactions that we make together. Something that allows us to, to see the processes and the systems around us you know, and, 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 you know, and, and in ways that makes them accessible and knowable to us. And Matt Webb at the uh, Reboot 2009 conference rephrased that. And he said, a microscope shows you where you are inside something that is much bigger than you, uh, so that you understand that something that is much bigger than you in a human way, on a human scale and with your human heart. And I quite like that rephrasing because it adds human emotion. And I think meaning is something deeply emotional. And when you do something together, we feel that, you know, if you do something together that you decided upon together, not because somebody told you so, it provides meaning, it creates deeper connections between us, and it renews sort of the social contract. We build society together that way. So doing something together needs to be part of our macroscope. And historically, barn raising, building a barn together comes to mind. Uh, and what stands out to me is that there's many different languages around the world that have a word for that collectively doing something, and that speaks of its significance. So our ability to solve things lies partly in this, in a group, a network of relationships that you care about. The role of groups in agency in our time, however, comes in, uh, in, a, in a way with a twist. It's different from what went before. Distributed digital networks are all around us, and the internet was originally intended as one. And human networks are somewhat alike to these digitally, digital distributed networks. 
messages travel through it, but not consistently. Notes make decisions. We share. They look. Uh, they disconnect. Notes have different levels of trust for other nodes. You know, they're better connected than others. And smartness is in the nodes. So in this way, networks of computers and people actually go much alike. And we live in this network world. And our understanding of agency actually needs to really embrace that, make it a design principle. Yet most of our tools are still standalone things. A group is not an island. It's always interconnected. And that you know, you know, necessitates the awareness that everything that you do has global consequences, and that global consequences translate to something that you can do locally. Agency, I think, resides not in individuals, but in groups. Not the groups of old, but these network groups. And this level of network is key, because really the complexity that we find in our own societies cannot be addressed at the individual level. I cannot solve anything. Most of it, we find, cannot be solved at societal level, one size fits all solutions, but needs to be done in uh, the place where all these interdependencies and feedback loops come together, and, you know, and where those outcomes are determined. Groups of relationships, networks, communities. And that makes you and your meaningful relationships uh, in a specific real life context, the unit of agency. You and your neighbors, like here in Morocco on Global Cleanup Day, uh, you and your sports team, you and your colleagues, you and your peers. And then different types of things can happen. This is uh, a project in a neighborhood in Amsterdam, in the eastern part of Amsterdam, uh, a socially uh, uh, disadvantaged neighborhood, lots of migration. Uh, and the neighbors here used open data to inform themselves about how government was actually spending money in the neighborhood and, you know, and, and see to which type of projects money flowed. And for the first time, everyone at the table had the same information uh, to start from. And that changed government spending. The people in the neighborhood took over most of the neighborhood activity. It reduced spending by the government. The people in the neighborhood created local jobs. They took over the local activity center. And, you know, and they are now teaching others in other neighborhoods to do the same thing. A single person would never have done this. City government would never have done this. A local group of neighbors caring about their own na neighborhood could do it and did it. And that's the second element of, of, of this networked agency potential and on which that network agency depends, working on meaningful needs, something that really matters to the people doing it. Um, because that, too, is, dealing, is key to dealing with complex surroundings, because uh, there are no generic answers available. So it needs to be valuable right in the context where people are uh, taking action. Um, the real and living context of the group that's doing it itself, where you and the people you hold dear actually want to see impact. So that's the question you have to ask yourself. Where do I want to see that impact? Not just for me, but for me and the people that I really care about. And if you find that, that's a tr tremendous source of power, um, doing something that matters to you. you know, and that feeling that power is a way out of despair. Um, I'm involved with a network, network called Edge Riders. Uh, it's active uh, basically across the world. Uh, and I think as a network, they're really great at generating uh, networked agency. There's another member. Uh, she's in uh, Tunisia, in a region called Medanin. And most people, young people, they actually leave because they see no opportunity uh, locally. But she started a collective space called Orgama. And uh, Dorsev, she's a young bioengineer and starting biohacker, after a time said, it's really funny how I actually found a life-changing opportunity right here and not having to move away, but staying right here and make it work right here. And last year, I worked with the uh, Frisian Regional Library for a few months, and we went to a primary school, worked with a, a group of 10 and 11-year-olds. You see some of them in the picture here, quite pixelated, I see. Um, and we asked them that, you know, if you could create, if you could do anything, what would you do? And their first answer was, we want to build a robot. All of them wanted to build robots, so we were a bit puzzled by that. So we asked a bit further, and then it turned out that when you're 10 year old, it's the time when your parents start teaching you to clean up your own room. So then you want, obviously, a robot because you want somebody to replace what mommy and daddy were doing for you. Um, but continuing that, you know, that conversation with them you know, about their shared needs, what they might want to do collectively as a group, 
uh, what they would like to change or create. We talked about, so if you walk from, from home to school or back home after school, what are the things that you would like to see changed? Where would you like to take influence? And that turned into a, a much richer picture of things. Um, uh, uh, they wanted to address bullying that they experienced. They wanted to reward good behavior more than punishing bad behavior in school. Some were concerned with traffic safety on, on their route to school. Others were concerned with cleaning up the waterways along the route. Two boys, were, they liked fishing a lot, but they encountered a lot of discarded bicycles and other trash in the water that they were fishing in. So we started talking about those type of things. And then we helped them access the technology and the working methods and bringing the people you know, uh, that could actually help them do it. And we asked them, who do you know that might actually help you do it? And from that, they started creating their own solutions. And the effect of working on something they actually really cared about uh, with the people that they knew, that hugely energized these kids. They created a periscope to find trash in the waterways. They introduced the school reward system. They built MP3 play players for every classroom so that they could listen to audiobooks more. And afterwards, they said it was the best thing they ever had experienced in their school. And I met one of the kids by coincidence during my summer holidays in the Austrian Alps a summer later. And uh, you know, he never even said hi or what a coincidence to meet you. He just immediately launched into describing to me how he was still building on the project that he worked on and all the improvements he still had in his mind that they should do as a class together. Being able to act on something meaningful to them, for themselves as a group, felt like a superpower to them. And it really is. It is a superpower. But to develop those superpowers, we need to take a very close look at the tools that we are using, both the technologies and the methods and processes that we use. I'm a techie and I'm a facilitator, and I've worked or tried my hand on most of these. Um, and I remember that when each came along, we promised ourselves that this would change the world. You know, now everybody could do everything that they wanted, they could solve. But we all approached them singularly. You know, when we first met uh, Paolo and I, we thought blogs, that was the craziest thing, and we had Dave's RSS to connect all of that up. You know, it was amazing, and the world would change. And the world did change, but not so much as we maybe hoped, or not in the same direction. We promised ourselves that these tools were already simple enough for most people to use, but they're really not. They're still very hard. You know, I tried to work with them. Uh, a lot of them I used. They're still extremely hard to do. I've been hosting my own blog for 15 years, but I still can lose lots of time you know, trying to you know, get my own home server to do what I want it to do. You know, um, and if you've ever been into a local community meetup or a town hall meeting or something like that, you, you probably remember how frustrated you were that you as a group could not manage the group process and discussions quickly escalated into something that was going absolutely nowhere. So we need to look at these technologies and methods and make them ever more simpler and accessible. And we also currently tend to see them as separate things, a technology, a method. But in practice, we usually combine them. We apply a technology in the context of certain methods. So we need to start designing them as uh, connected elements as well. As technologists and as fa facilitators or storytellers here in the room, it's really up to us to change the, these tools, both the technology and the methods. And what's wrong with most of them is that they're not really ours, like Doc Searles recently blocked when he was talking about uh, chatbots. Um, you know, most of these tools are not within the control of the group of people who are actually using it. And we need to do that. Um, bring them in control for me and my neighbors, me and my friends. You know? uh, blockchain, I feel, is much more useful if we can deploy it, for instance, for a local currency running on local computing nodes like Hillcoin is doing in the UK, than me having to trust you know, uh, uh, things like Bitcoin that currently runs most of the transactions on five Chinese superclusters. So it's re-centralizing something that was meant to be distributed. Um, I think that maybe the German Pirate Party would have been more effective if they hadn't dabbled in politics, but really made sure that you could actually use their great tool, Liquid Feedback, for group decision making, and had ensured that every single community in Germany actually understood how to deploy and manage that. And now it feels like you need a decade worth of Unix sysadmin experience to actually install it. 
Now, it's not accessible. For any tool, you know, if we want to leave Facebook, why don't we have a diaspora pod that I can hook up to my router and find my five best friends in and then have it federate with everybody doing the same thing and rebuild Facebook in that way? For any tool, we need to be able, as a group, to deploy it, alter it, iterate on it, control it, and trust it as a group. Otherwise, it's not ours. Tools need to be smaller than us in that regard. They cannot be bigger than us as a, as a group. For any tool, an instance of it needs to be useful, and a network of those instances need to be more useful. Then we get to networked agency. Tools plus community says Howard Rheingold is a literacy, and networked agency is a literacy in that regard. So pulling this all uh, together, um, networked agency, I think, is about enabling groups, active in living context, things that actually matter to the group in that specific situation, with tools, combinations of technologies and methods, within our own control, and distributed and networked in nature. And I su suggest to apply these notions uh, as a design aid, as scaffolding for how we approach how we want to act ourselves and how we approach how we want to deploy technology so that we can actually rediscover this ability to act and find a way out of uh, despair because we know how to solve things for ourselves, fill that agency uh, potential. Um, much how I work with the school class that i just shown you, um, the Library of Friesland is actually now always working like that with the groups that they uh, work with. So they use local libraries to engage in neighborhoods and ask, so what are the things that you would actually like to address and what do you need locally to be able to do that? And that has lasting effects. Uh, and, and that's interesting because before those libraries were more, like say, uh, demonstrating the possibilities. Like we were a decade and a half ago, blocks are great, use blocks. You know, uh, and now they're actually helping people to change their own lives with those tools. So, paraphrasing uh, Lincoln from his Gettysburg Address, network agency is something that is for the living context, by the living context, and of the living context. And it provides groups in a specific situation with classic striking power, which is sort of the old-fashioned agency, but also with the agility to use and adapt what global networks pass on to them, so the opportunities that come to you, all the knowledge and examples and designs that come to you through the global network, but also the resilience to mitigate, let's say, the cascading failures that also propagate through that network, so that you can disconnect for a while to let the storm pass, because you have your own instances of all these technologies running on your own. All of our technologies and methods, I feel, need to, to, to fit this mold. You know? uh, otherwise, they will, will fail to provide us with networked agency. And as a consequence, that will further disempower us as a society, much in the way that Hossein uh, just described to us. So for us in the room, I think all this comes with a, with a number of civic duties. If you're experimenting with something, it means you need to write about it. You, know, you need, need to publish that. In the project that we did with the school class, we did not suggest that up front to the kids to document what they were doing, uh, but they came across it themselves. They said, hey, this is really worthwhile. We need to find a way of spreading this. And they asked us to help them ha uh, learn them how to build websites to do that. Um, and especially if you're a technologist or process facilitator or a storyteller, we have an obligation to further lower the threshold for people uh, that we, you know, for, for, for all these things that we know already work very well, to lower the threshold for everybody else that we care about. So that your neighbor can use it, that your closest friends can use it, and your buddies can use it. Because if we are not going to really enable the people that we care about, who will? Thank you very much.